honor. Um, I'll do that. Uh, we'll, we'll return to this later with Mr. Tam or the deposition excerpts. I would think that would be an appropriate place to take it up. All right, Ms. Stewart, you brought us to this afternoon after all. <laughs> all right, let's resume counsel at 1.30 or may, make it 1.40. The next witness is going to be? Uh, Dr. Peplau, Your Honor. Dr. Peplau, Your Honor. Very well. What time did you say, Your Honor? 140, Mr. Cooper, is that okay? It certainly is. All right, good. Very well, shall we have the next witness? Yes, Your Honor. Plaintiffs call Dr. Ann Peplau. Very well. I do. My name is Leticia Ann Peplau. P E P L A U. Leticia, L E T I T I A. And for the record, my name is Christopher Dussault, Gibson Dunn and Crutcher for the plaintiffs. Thank you. Good afternoon, Dr. Peplau. Afternoon. Dr. Peplau, what is your educational background? I have a bachelor's degree in psychology from Brown University and a PhD in social psychology from Harvard University. What is social psychology? Social psychology is the sub-branch within psychology that studies human relationships, human groups, social influences, basically the relationships among people. And are you currently employed? I'm a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles. And when did you join the faculty at UCLA? I joined the faculty in 1973. And are you ten tenured? Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, what is your position within the psychology department? I am a professor of psychology. I'm also the vice chair for graduate studies in psychology. And what is the, the general reputation of UCLA psychology graduate department? It's a very respected department, and we are ranked in the top five nationwide. Okay. Dr. Peplau, do you lead any programs at UCLA? I do. I am the director of the UCLA Interdisciplinary Relationship Science Program. It's a graduate training program funded by the National Science Foundation. And in what does it train? It trains doctoral students from several disciplines who want to specialize in studying social relationships. That can include family relationships, marriage, friendship, as well as same-sex relationships. Have you uh, received any professional honors I have. in your work? I have. I've received a number of lifetime achievement or uh, scientific contribution awards. One is from the Society of S the Scientific Study of Sexuality, and several of them are from different divisions of the American Psychological Association. And have you served as president on any societies? Yes. I was elected president of the International Association for Relationship Research. Okay. In the course of your professional work in social psychology, has your study focused on any particular topics? It's focused on three interrelated topics, close personal relationships, sexual orientation, and gender. Have you conducted research on heterosexual couples? Yes, I have. And also on same-sex couples? Yes. And in studying relationships, have you looked at marriage? I have looked primarily at relationships other than marriage, but I have done some studies that have involved marriage, yes. Okay, and do you study relationships of lesbians and gay men? I do, yes. And when did you begin that? I began studying same-sex couples in the early 1970s. At that time, there was very little research in the area, and I was one of the first psychologists to do that research. Today, of course, there are many, many more people studying same-sex relationships, and the field has grown substantially. Have you, off have you authored any books? I've written or co-authored about 10 books. And on what subjects? Some have been general topics in psychology, introductory psychology, social psychology. 
Others have been professional level books. One is on close relationships, another one on loneliness. I edited a book on gender, culture, and ethnicity. I edited a volume on same-sex couples and another volume on women's sexuality. Have you written articles? Yeah, I've written, oh, probably 120 journal articles and chapters for scholarly books. Are these articles uh, generally published in peer-reviewed journals? I believe all of them have been published in peer-reviewed scientific journals. Um, and have you done reviews of other scholars' work? Yes. I've written what I would call literature reviews, that is, chapters of edited books in which I have reviewed the current state of research and theory on a particular theory or a particular topic. Uh, Your Honor, I would um, actually, if I may direct the witness to Plaintiff's Exhibit 2329. Uh, okay, just to be clear, the way we have the witness binder organized, Your Honor, is uh, certain exhibits that will be introduced individually or in the front. And then there's an A, a B, and a C tab at the bottom for certain exhibits that will be introduced collectively. So, if we could look at 2329, Dr. Peplau. I'm not finding that in this binder. Your Honor, may I approach? Perhaps you could guide us both through. I'm having the same trouble the witness is. Are you? Uh, actually, I think I just found it. Um, it's just prior to tab A? Yes. Oh, I see, I see. All right. Numerical order is a wonderful thing, counsel. <laughs> Understood, Your Honor. All right. Uh, Dr. Peplau, is that a true and correct copy of your CV? It is. Your Honor, I would submit Exhibit 2329 into evidence. No objection. Very well. Okay. Um, and Your Honor, I would tender Professor Peplau as an expert on couple relationships within the field of social psychology. Can he what No, Your Honor, no objection. Very well, you may proceed, Mr. Dussault. Thank you. Dr. Peplau, do you intend to offer opinions today in this case? Yes, I'll be offering four opinions. Okay, and what are those opinions? My first opinion is that for those adults who choose to enter into marriage, that marriage is often associated with many important benefits. I will also offer the opinion that research examining the relationships of gay and lesbian couples has found remarkable similarities between the research of same-sex couples and heterosexual couples. I will offer the opinion that when same-sex couples are permitted to enter into civil marriage, that they will likely have the same benefits from marriage that heterosexuals do. And fourth, I'll offer the opinion that permitting same-sex civil marriage will not be harmful to heterosexual marriage. Thank you. All right, Dr. Peplau, let's start with the first opinion that you mentioned. Have there been research and studies into how Americans feel about marriage? Americans are very enthusiastic about marriage. Most Americans view marriage as one of the most important relationships in their life. Many people view getting married as a very important life goal. And when researchers have surveyed Americans and asked their opinions about marriage, they find a similar pattern. For example, um, a recent Gallup opinion poll asked a representative sample of Americans about marriage. And 91% of those people reported that they either have been married or plan to get married at some time in the future. Is there any evidence of which you're aware that lesbians and gay men feel the same way about marriage? Yes, of course. For uh, in most states, asking lesbians and gay marriage about ma gay men about marriage is a hy hypothetical question, but the question has been raised. In a recent survey conducted by the Kaiser Family Foundation, the question was asked, if you were able to legally marry someone of the same sex, would you like to do so at some time in your life? And the majority of lesbians and gay men, 74%, said that yes, indeed, they would like to get married if they had that option. All right. And uh, turn, if you would, in your binder to Plaintiff's Exhibit 938. This is in the first section before tab A. Yes, I have it. Okay, and Dr. Peplau, is this the study that you were just referring to? It is. 
And is this something you have relied on in reaching your opinions? Yes. This is the Kaiser Family Foundation study of lesbians and gay men. Your Honor, we would submit Plaintiff's Exhibit 938 into evidence. No objection. Very well, 938 is admitted. Dr. Peplau, are you aware of any research on the subject of whether people in this country value domestic partnerships to the same extent that they value marriage? Researchers have been interested in whether lesbians and gay men would prefer to get married or would prefer other options such as civil unions or registered partnerships. Evidence on this point comes from research done by Gary Gates, Lee Badgett, and others. And what these researchers did was to ask the question, we now have several states that have options for civil unions and registered partnerships. And they asked the question, across all of those states that permit that, in the first year, what percent of same-sex cohabiting couples in the state actually took advantage of that option? And when they asked, in Massachusetts, where marriage is an option, in the first year that marriage was available to same-sex couples, what percent got married? What they found was that whereas across the states that permit civil unions and partnerships, about 10 to 12 percent of couples in the first year took that option. And in contrast, in Massachusetts, when marriage became available, something like 37 percent of the couples got married, suggesting that couples were three times more likely to get married than to enter into one of these other quasi-marital options. Okay. Uh, Dr. Peplau, if you would turn to tab 909, which is in the front section, before tab A of the binder. And this, the Gates, Badgett, and Hose study, is this the one that you referred to? Yes, it is. Okay, Your Honor, plaintiffs would move Exhibit 909 into evidence. No objection. Very well, 909 is admitted. Are you aware of any research regarding the impact of marriage, if any, on health? There's a very large body of research on the impact for heterosexuals on marriage, on, of, of marriage on health. Uh, these are studies that have compared the health of married individuals to the health of other adults who are not married. And the very consistent findings from those research are that, on average, married individuals fare better. They are physically healthier, they tend to live longer, they engage in fewer risky behaviors, they look better on measures of psychological well-being. Okay. Now, are you aware of any recent studies of particular note that document the health benefits associated with marriage? Yes. One of the recent studies on that is a government study conducted by researchers at the Centers for Disease Control. And what they did was to interview a representative sample of Americans, a very large sample, more than 100,000 people, and to do these comparisons between married individuals and other individuals on a range of questions about health. And what they found was that if you control for age and for income and education, for a few things like that, for race, that across all of these groups, the married individuals did better on virtually every measure. So the married couples reported fewer health problems. They were less likely to indicate that their daily activities at home or at work were restricted because of a physical ailment of some sort. They were less likely to smoke. They were less likely to drink in excess. They were less likely to report headaches and migraines. Now we could go on, but the consistent pattern was that on average, the married couples were better in terms of health. All right. And does the research tell us anything, anything about why marriage is associated with health benefits? Well, that's certainly been an important question for research, researchers. And there are two main explanations that have been considered. One is what's been called a selection effect. And the idea here is that perhaps people who are healthier to start out with are more likely to be able to attract a partner to get married. And maybe because of their health and mental health as well, uh, they are better able to maintain a satisfying relationship. That would be a selection effect. The second hypothesis or second explanation is what's called a protection effect. And that's the idea that there are things associated with marriage that actually enhance and contribute to health things that people didn't bring into the relationship, but that they experience as a result of being married. 
And research pretty clearly demonstrates that the selection effect is only a partial answer, that there are definitely appear to be a protective effect for many couples, for individuals in many couples, of being married. Can you explain to us why marriage might be associated with what you describe as protective effects? Yes. I think there would be at least four reasons for that. One is that for many people, getting married reflects a change of identity. That when psychologists sometimes ask people to describe who they are, they say, well, if you ask me, I might say, I'm a wife, I'm a psychologist, I'm an American. And I would be indicating important identities that I value and that were part of who I am as a person. And for many people, marriage is one of these identities. So it is, as I said earlier, it's an important life goal. Achieving that life goal can lead people to feel good about themselves, can enhance their self-esteem. Marriage is a valued status in society. Uh, so being part of that inf institution can make you feel good about yourself. As well, being part of, uh, part of being married may mean, well, now I'm an adult. Now I really need to be a kind of mature, responsible person. And maybe that would lead us to take better care of ourselves. Or maybe we'll feel more responsible for our spouse and say, well, you know, I'm not just in it for me. I'm in it for my partner as well. So perhaps I ought to give up rock climbing and be more careful about how much I drink. So these would be ways in which marriage, the status of being married, might affect the individual. Uh, second thing is that marriage is about a relationship between two people. And there are often important ways in which spouses support each other, help each other, try to encourage each other to lead healthier lives. And so this kind of support from another person can enhance your health. So we talked about the individual and then the couple. There's also a broader social network that when people get married, they develop relationships not only with their partner, but also within an extended family with kin, that marriage links two families. So that if prior to marriage, each per person had relatives who cared about them and friends, now they may have two networks and two groups of people who are there as resources to them, who can help them through tough times. And so this connection to an extended community and family network can be helpful to people's health. And finally, marriage can also lead to various kinds of support from government, to beneficial laws or being eligible for programs or for health insurance through employer or a, a slew of other things that can also contribute to health and well-being. And now, of course, this doesn't happen automatically in every marriage. There are things that happen in good mar these are things that happen in good marriages. Some marriages are conflict-ridden and miserable, and some don't confer these benefits. But on average, marriage does seem to be associated with benefits, and I think for many good reasons. Okay. Now, Dr. Peplau, if you would turn to your exhibit binder and now turning to exhibit, to tab A. There's a series of exhibits here that we've kind of grouped together, and I'll read the numbers into the record. They are plaintiff's exhibit 781, 913, 937, 964, 1043, 1171, 1173, 1250, 1254, and 1474. Do you see those? I do. I don't think they're all in the order you read them in. Are we behind tab A? I thought so, yeah. Um, as I look through them, these are all articles that are relevant to the issue of the benefits of marriage? Yeah, and are these articles that you've relied on in forming your opinions that you've testified to today about the benefits of marriage? Yes, they are. Okay, Your Honor, I would move those exhibits into evidence. If I could just have one minute to flip through the binder. Certainly. Uh, no objection, Your Honor. Very well. I won't read the entire list, but those exhibits are admitted. Okay, thank you, Your Honor. 
Now, Dr. Peplau, let's talk about the second opinion that you mentioned when you were beginning your testimony regarding the similarity between opposite sex and same sex relationships. Has social science research been done that compares same sex relationships and heterosexual relationships? Yes. There have been quite a number of studies that include samples of both same-sex and heterosexual couples and that compare them in a variety of systematic ways. And has that body of work been well received in your field? Yes, it has. It's been published in peer-reviewed journals. It's been presented at major scientific meetings and so on. What are the primary topics of the study in this body of work? Well, one major topic has been to examine the quality of same-sex relationships and to ask how similar or different it is to the quality of heterosexual relationships. Second major topic has been to look at the stability of relationships, their durability over time. And then a third major topic has to been to look at the processes or the dynamics that affect relationships to ask questions about whether the quality and the stability of same-sex couples' relationships are influenced by the same kind of factors that apply in heterosexual couples. And I'd like to ask you about each of those individually, but first, let me ask you, does this research as a whole show whether there is or is not a similarity generally between same-sex and opposite-sex relationships? One of the striking things about this research is the consistency of findings across different studies conducted by different researchers using somewhat different methodologies. And the consistent finding is one of great similarity across couples, both same-sex and heterosexual. Now, the first topic that you mentioned was the quality of relationships. Has research been done examining and comparing the overall quality of same-sex and opposite-sex relationships? Yes, and let me just say for a moment that what I mean by quality, uh, because researchers have tried to study quality or to measure it in a variety of different ways. Researchers have developed standardized measures of relationship adjustment. We've developed standardized measures of love, of commitment, feelings of closeness in relationship. These are multiple items standardized measures. In addition, researchers have also conducted observational studies in which they bring couples into the laboratory and ask them to talk to each other about an assigned topic while, they videotape, or while they're being videotaped. And when the researchers systematically code those interactions and they ask questions like, how much warmth does the couple express for each other? Do they express sarcasm? What's the quality of their interaction? So I want to emphasize that a lot of different methods have been used to assess quality. And regardless of how it's measured, the consistent finding time and again has been that on average, same-sex couples and heterosexual couples are indistinguishable. And that doesn't mean that all couples are enormously happy. It means there are some happy couples, some okay couples, some not so happy couples in all groups. But on average, the level of quality is the same. Dr. Peplau, have you ever heard a view or a stereotype expressed that same-sex couples are somehow generally unhappy or dissatisfied? I have, yes. I think it's a common stereotype that's been, well, there's several pieces to it. One, that gay men and lesbians have trouble forming relationships, that if they do form relationships, they are kind of unstable they don't last very long, and that maybe the quality of those relationships is inferior to the quality of heterosexual relationships. And is there any support in your field that you have seen for that stereotype of relationships? None at all. Okay. You also mentioned um, the stability of relationships. Has research been done comparing the stability of same-sex and opposite-sex relationships? Yes, it has. And what has that shown? Well. The stability of a relationship refers to how long the relationship lasts over time. For married couples, we have government statistics that tell us when couples marry and when they divorce, or when the relationship is dissolved in various ways. So we have pretty good national data sets about heterosexual marriages and their length. We do not have comparable data for same-sex couples. 
Nonetheless, researchers have been able to rely on large-scale surveys, some of them now representative surveys, that address this question and that have really provided evidence that a substantial portion, proportion of lesbians and gay men are in relationships, that many of these relationships are long-term. Mm -hmm. Are there any examples of studies that have shown that lesbians and gay men are, in fact, able to form committed, long-lasting relationships? I think one of the best studies is a study by Carpenter and Gates that was published in Demography, the leading journal for demographers, Demog demographers, excuse me. Uh, what these researchers did was to analyze data from a survey conducted in California of a representative sample of lesbians and gay men in the state. And one of the questions that was asked on that survey was, are you currently in a cohabiting relationship with a same-sex partner? And what the researchers found was that 61% of the lesbian respondents said yes, they were living with another woman in a loving relationship. And about 46% of the gay men said they were currently in a cohabiting relationship. And just for comparison, the researchers mentioned that if you looked in the same age range of 18 to 59 at heterosexuals, you would find that about 62% of heterosexuals are either married or cohabitating. So the percentage of heterosexuals and for lesbians was essentially the same. And for gay men, it wasn't terribly different. And um, did that study also look at whether gay men and lesbians are typically able to form long-lasting relationships? Yes. Uh, another question that was asked was, how long has your current cohabitating relationship been going on? Uh, now, to put that in context, the average person who was part of this survey was about 41 years old. So if you think they're 41 now and their relationship's been going on, say, for 10 years, they were 31 when the relationship began. And I think that indicates that these are people who, early in adulthood, found a partner, established a relationship, and for the bulk of the, their young adulthood, that they were with the same partner. So I think the survey provides compelling evidence both that many lesbians and gay men are in a relationship and that at least some of those relationships are of quite long duration. Now, to your knowledge, are there any professional organizations that have weighed in on the subject of whether lesbians and gay men can and do form committed relationships? Yes, my own. My own organization, the American Psychological Association, the largest association in the world of professional psychologists, has recently adopted a position power, a paper, a uh, resolution on the topic. And turn, if you would, Dr. Peplau, to exhibit 765 in your binder, which is in the second exhibit in the front. Is this the document to which you are referring? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. It's the APA policy statement on sexual orientation and marriage. And it was adopted by the APA Council of Representatives in July 2004. Your Honor, we would offer Plaintiff's Exhibit 765 into evidence. No objection. 765 is admitted. And if we could put the first demonstrative on the screen here. Dr. Peplau. Is this one of the findings from the study that you were referencing, that many lesbians and gay men have formed durable relationships? Yes, it is. Okay. And could we turn to the second slide, please? Um, and is it also one of the findings, Dr. Peplau, that the factors that predict relationship satisfaction, relationship commitment, and relationship stability are remarkably similar for both same-sex cohabiting couples and heterosexual married couples? Yes. Okay. Now, is there some evidence that on average cohabiting gay and lesbian relationships are of slightly shorter duration? Well, as I mentioned before, we don't have directly controllable information, but there is some suggestion that that might be the case. Okay. And do you have any explanation for that? I think there are several possible explanations. One is that because the data aren't directly comparable, married couples may be a more 
maybe a group that's more selected for high levels of commitment and intention to stay together for a long time. Cohabitating couples, in contrast, may be a more diverse group of people, some of whom feel great levels of commitment and others of whom don't. So it's a comparison that may, to some extent, be like mixing apples and oranges. But I think there are several other reasons as well. One is that gay men and lesbians don't have the benefits of marriage, and that marriage is, for many relationships, a stabilizing influence. And we've talked about that, and we'll talk more about why that may be the case. Another reason may be that sexual orientation, being gay or lesbian, is still a stigmatized identity in the United States. And so there may be ways in which stigma and prejudice and discrimination take a toll on the relationships of lesbians and gay men. Let me see if I understand the testimony. Are you saying that there is a difference in durability of relationships among cohabiting heterosexuals from married heterosexuals? That's true. By comparison, I meant to be given, well, the comparison I meant to be giving was um, between same sex cohabiting or not cohabiting couples and married heterosexuals. I, I was really trying to do a comparison between same sex couples and heterosexual couples. And what I was saying was that we have a very clear idea of who those heterosexual couples are because they are typically married couples. But that same sex couples can be. Uh, more mixed group. What do the data show with respect to differences, if any, between married couples, presumably heterosexual couples, and cohabitating heterosexual couples? Is there a difference in the durability of those two relationships? Yes, there is. Uh, on average, and again, we're talking gross averages, but on average, uh, heterosexual couples cohabitating heterosexual cohabitating relationships are of a shorter duration than heterosexual marriages. Uh, Dr. Peplau, you referenced earlier the issue of processes in relationships. Has research been done into whether the same processes are at work in the relationships of same-sex couples on the one hand and opposite-sex couples on the other? Yes, it has. Um, let me just give one example of what I mean by a process. One of the things researchers have studied is what factors determine the quality of the level of satisfaction in a relationship. Um, and obviously an important factor would be arguments or f conflicts between the partners. And so researchers have examined the extent to which same-sex and heterosexual couples have the same frequency of arguing, which they do. Uh, the extent to which they may be arguing about similar sorts of things? And the answer is yes. The extent to which they may try to work out their disagreements to negotiate in similar ways? And the answer is they do. And then the process question is, is the relationship between high levels of conflict and low satisfaction the same for both types of couples? And the answer there is that yes, it is that level of conflict influences the quality of both kinds of relationships. <clears throat> and now, looking at the three factors that you mentioned <clears throat> together, quality, stability, and the sameness of processes that affect those factors, is there a consensus in the research as to whether these factors are similar between same-sex and opposite-sex couples? Yes. The overwhelming finding and the consensus of professionals in the field <clears throat> is of similarity across these two types of couples. All right. What I'd like to do now is just move into the record a group of documents that are behind tab B that support Dr. Peplau's opinion about the similarities between opposite sex and same sex relationships. <clears throat> these are the documents that are found at tab B. And for the record, they are plaintiff's exhibits 921. 942, 1050, 1054, 1130, 1137, 1142, 1144, 1150, and 1166, and 
one two three one. One one five six. One one six six, Your Honor. Six six. One two three one. One two three four. One two three six and one two four five. Your Honor, plaintiffs would submit those documents into evidence. <laughs> Hearing no objection. Your Honor, if I could just have, again, just one moment to look at the tab. Uh, no objection, Your Honor. Of course. Very well. Thank you, Ms. Moss. Proceed, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Peplau, let's talk about the third opinion that you mentioned at the beginning of your testimony. Do you have an opinion as to whether gay and lesbian individuals would benefit from marriage? Yes, I do. And what is that opinion? My opinion, based on the great similarities that have been documented between same-sex couples and heterosexual couples, is this. If same-sex couples were permitted to marry, that they would also enjoy the same benefits. Now. To your knowledge, have any professional organizations come to the same conclusion? Oh, yes. The American Psychiatric Association, which is the national organization of physician psychiatrists, medical experts who study mental health and illness, have issued a policy statement on that. If you could explain, Dr. Peplau, um, well, if I could, Dr. Peplau, direct your attention to Plaintiff's Exhibit 787, which is the third exhibit from the front of your binder. Is this the policy statement of the American Psychiatric Association to which you referenced a moment ago? Yes, it is. And I would just note that it was approved by their assembly and also approved by the Board of Trustees. So it went through a vetting process in the professional organization. And that happened in 2005. Your Honor, plaintiffs would submit Exhibit 787 into evidence. No objection. 787 is admitted. Dr. Peplau, we've highlighted a statement from this policy um, statement of the American Psychiatric Association. Could you please read that highlighted portion? Sure. It says, in the interest of maintaining and promoting mental health, the American Psychiatric Association supports the legal recognition of same-sex civil marriage with all rights, benefits, and responsibilities conferred by civil marriage and opposes restrictions to, the, to those same rights, benefits, and responsibilities. Now, Dr. Peplau, have there been any empirical studies on the effects of marriage on American gay and lesbian individuals who choose to marry and are able to? My, let me just step back and say that my strong belief that same-sex couples would benefit from civil marriage is based primarily on the large body of research about heterosexuals benefiting from marriage and the body of research about similarities and differences. Based on that, I would predict that in states in the United States that permit same-sex marriage, that we would not see any change either in the rate of people getting married or in the rate of people getting divorced. And in order to look at that prediction, I went to the government website that provides statistics, federal statistics on the annual rates for marriage and for divorce in Massachusetts. And I looked at the four years prior to same-sex marriage being legal and the four years after. And in what I was looking at, there was, has there been a change in the rates of marriage or of divorce associated with the introduction of civil same-sex marriage? And what's very clear from those data is there has been no change, that the rates of marriage and divorce are no different after civil marriage was permitted than they were before. Dr. Peplau, I would direct your attention to Exhibit 959 in the front section of your binder. Nine? I'm having trouble finding it. I believe. 959. Yes. I have it. I apologize. I'm not finding it. Uh, Do you have? You have it. Your Honor, may I approach the witness and show her mine? By all means. By all means. Oh, okay. <laughs> Dr. Peplow, is Exhibit 959 the study that you're referencing to, that you looked at, 
looked at about results where couples have been permitted to marry, same-sex couples have been permitted to marry? Uh, what I was referring to before were government statistics about rates of marriage and divorce. Uh, one of the other things that I would predict would be that if we surveyed individuals who had gotten married in civil same-sex marriages in Massachusetts, that they would report benefiting from that. And there is one study that addresses that issue. Uh, this is a study by Ramos and others. They used data that was collected by the Massachusetts Department of Health. The Department of Health was very interested in trying to understand what some of the impact might have been of marriage for same-sex couples in their state. And so I believe four years after marriage was permitted, they conducted a survey. It was not a representative sample, but it was a sample that included over 500 lesbians and gay men who had been married in Massachusetts. And the survey asked those, individual quest those individuals questions about why they had gotten married, whether they thought that marriage had improved their lives in a variety of ways. And for those individuals who were raising children, they also asked ch uh, people's beliefs about how the marriage had affected the children. And <clears throat> what did that study show us as to the effects of access to marriage on same-sex couples? Well, one of the things the researchers found, I think, is not at all surprising, and that is that after they got married, many of the couples said they felt more committed to each other. I think heterosexual newlyweds might well say the same thing. But there were also other things that the couples said that I think are particularly noteworthy. Many of the married lesbians and gay men said that they, they believed that their families were now more approving of their relationship. Many of them said that they felt less worried about legal problems. And a third of them said that either they or their spouse now had access to health benefits from an employer that they had not had before getting married. And so they were reporting a number of benefits. And for those couples who had children, uh, I think I mentioned that was about 25% of the respondents in this survey they overwhelmingly reported that marriage had been beneficial to the children. 95% of them said that they thought the children had benefited from the fact that they were now married. Your Honor, plaintiffs would move into evidence, Exhibit 959. No objection. 959 is admitted. Dr. Peplau, what was, or was it your conclusion that this study of Massachusetts supported the opinions that you drew through your other research as to the benefits of marriage? Yes. Potential benefits of marriage? Yes. For same-sex couples? Yes. So then let's turn now to the, from the benefits of marriage for same-sex couples to the fourth opinion that you said you wish to offer today, which is the question of whether allowing same-sex marriages would harm heterosexual marriages. Do you, Dr. Peplau, have an opinion as to whether allowing gay and lesbian couples to marry would in any way affect the stability of heterosexual marriages? I do have an opinion. And it is that I think it would have no impact on the stability of heterosexual marriages. And why is that? Well, we might say that by stability we really mean two things. One would be, is it going to affect entry into marriage? So are fewer heterosexuals going to decide to marry because same-sex couples can marry? And then the other would be exit from marriage. Are we going to see an increase in divorce? Okay, let's start with entry. Okay. Based on your work in this field, in the study of relationships, do you see any basis for an argument that allowing same-sex couples to marry would lead fewer heterosexual couples to enter into marriage? No, I don't. I think we have a large literature that tells us some of the many reasons why people get married. Many of them have to do with the fact that they are in love with someone, that they want to establish a life together, that they've been planning to get married since they were young children, and, and this has been a life goal. These are things about their relationship. They are things about a special other person, and there is nothing that I am aware of in the way of data or theory that would suggest that same-sex civil marriage would lead to fewer homosexuals getting married. Okay, so let's turn to the second part of the equation as you describe it. 
Is there any basis in your years of study for the concept that allowing same-sex couples to marry would lead more married heterosexual couples to exit or to divorce from their marriages? I can think of no reason. Uh, that is, it's very hard for me to imagine that you would have a happily married couple who would say, Gertrude, we've been married for 30 years, but I think we have to throw in the towel because Adam and Stuart down the block just got married. <laughs> We know a lot about factors that lead relationships to fall apart. Uh, the immediate cause is usually that couples are having conflict. They are arguing. The relationship has gone sour. Or if they're not arguing, it feels empty. They feel that their needs are not being met in the relationship. They're very personal reasons for getting divorced. We also know that some of the people who are at greater risk of divorce, people with low levels of education, people who are poor, whose relationships are under great stress and may not have the resources to meet those stresses. Nothing that we know about all these kinds of factors that lead to divorce has anything to do with civil rights for same-sex couples. Now, there's obviously been some argument and evidence around this issue about exposure to marriage. Do you have an understanding of what percentage or even roughly what proportion of married couples in America would be same-sex couples if same-sex couples were permitted to marry? My estimate would be that if same-sex couples were permitted to marry, that perhaps 2% of couples, 1 to 2 to 3%, some very small percentage would be same-sex couples. And to be clear on what you mean, 1 to 3% of all married couples? Of all married couples, absolutely. Would be? Thank you. Yeah. OK. Now, also, do you have, let me make sure I understand. If, if same-sex couples are permitted to marry, then presumably there would be more married couples in the country or, or in California than otherwise, correct? That's correct. OK. Now, do you have a view as to whether that would have any impact, one way or the other, on marriage? Well, you know, we usually see it as a sign of the health of an institution like marriage, or really of any institution, if more people want to join. And one of the things that has worried some people about heterosexual marriage is that fewer people are getting married, and many of them, or more of them, are getting divorced. So the idea that there's a group of American citizens who want to enter into this institution to keep it going, to keep it vibrant and alive, from my perspective, seems like a very good omen for the future of America. Dr. Peplau, have, <clears throat> have any professional organizations commented on whether keeping marriage as exclusively a man-to-woman union is essential? Uh, to avoiding some sort of harm to our society? Yes, I think, uh, you know, the group that's best, the professional group that's best able to comment on what, uh, uh, on that are anthropologists, <clears throat> professionals trained to study varying patterns across time and place in culture. And there's a large group of anthropologists who study kinship, family, and so on. And the professional organization of anthropologists, the American Anthropological Association, has taken an, a position on this issue. Okay, turn, if you would, Dr. Peplau, to the very first exhibit in your binder, which I'm hoping is 754. Yes. Okay. Is this the statement of the American Anthropological Association that you just referenced? Yes, it is. Your Honor, plaintiffs would submit exhibit 754 into evidence. No objection. Very well. And as we, as we did with some of the earlier statements, we have culled out some of the language. Can you read uh, that into the record? Sure. The results of more than a century of anthropological research on households, kinship relationships, and families across cultures and through time provide no support whatsoever for the view that either civilization or viable social orders depend upon marriage as an exclusively heterosexual institution. Rather, anthropological research supports the conclusion that a vast array of family types, including families built upon same-sex partnerships, 
can contribute to stable and humane societies. Now, Dr. Peplow, I may have gotten you into this issue earlier accidentally. Is there empirical evidence in the United States that you are aware of on the issue of whether same-sex marriages have any adverse effect on the lasting stability of heterosexual marriages? I think, it, I think we talked a bit earlier about data from Massachusetts about whether permitting, whether the change permitting same-sex couples to marry in Massachusetts had led either to an increase in the divorce rate or a decrease in the rate of people getting married. And I would see those data showing no difference before and after same-sex marriage as very consistent with the argument that we would not expect harm. And Your Honor, plaintiffs would move into evidence the exhibits that are found on tab C of the binder, which is plaintiffs' exhibits 1145, 1151, and 1195. What was the second one you mentioned? Uh, 1145, 1151. Thank you. And 1195. No objection. And Dr. Peplau. Very well, those exhibits will be admitted. Admitted. Proceed. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Peplau, are those documents uh, materials that you have relied on in reaching your view, the fourth opinion you offered, that allowing same-sex marriages would not harm heterosexual marriages? Yes, they are. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I have nothing further. Very well, Ms. Ross, you may cross-examine. Uh, may I approach, Your Honor? Yes. 